John, Walter, welcome. You two have been titanic forces in promoting freedom and capitalism. You're both fans of Milton Friedman. And 50 years ago, Milton published a famous essay, The Corporate Social Responsibility of Businesses is to Maximize Profits. Well, that got a lot of backlash. It also triggered a lot of deregulation in the decades that followed. And it's important because if leaders don't understand what their purpose and role is, it's really hard to succeed. And if they come into work each day, marching in to work on the defensive, it's just no way to go about life. Right? Instead, they should have a crystal clear picture of what it means to triumph and go after that with everything they've got. So with us today, we have John, John Mackey, founder of Whole Foods, and you've created one of the greatest companies on planet Earth, in my opinion, turned food shopping from a chore into an experience that feels like a celebration of life. And you're also a philosopher. You wrote Conscious Capitalism and spearheaded an entire movement. And Walter, you, Walter Block, one of the most prolific, maybe the most prolific writer alive on the topic of free markets, one of your many, many works, Defending the Undefendable, is so fascinating. It comes out in defense of the freedom, not the morality, but the freedom of pimps and prostitutes and druggies, blackmailers, basically the whole set of whipping boys for unconstrained capitalism. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you two can say in defense of capitalism. John, why don't we start with you? And what is it that you think people should know that makes capitalism worth fighting for, worth saving, worth concerning this, themselves with today? Sure, Josh, thanks. The first thing is, is that people have sort of a, um, a very jaded view. Capitalism has been named by its greatest enemy, Karl Marx named it capitalism. And I, I actually think a better term is Deidre McCloskey is kind of came up with innovism. I actually prefer innovationism because I don't think people know what innovism means, but they get innovationism. And whenever I trot that out there, uh, people get it. One thing to understand is that we, we never have had a pure free market economy and arguably we've never had a completely slave economy either. Uh, meaning there have always been some private property, even if it's just your toothbrush, but it's, it's on a continuum. And so to really understand capitalism and innovation is we have to understand that that ha that's very far down the continuum of economic freedom. And so I think economic freedom versus um, government control, the, the more economic freedom you have, the more you have a capitalistic innovationist economy and the more government control you have, the less economic freedom you have and the more socialism or communism that you have. And that's just important because it's not just a bifurcated binary world. There's people, different economies shape up in different ways. But for most of history, we did not have very much economic freedom. And as a result, we had global poverty. And what's happened when we, when we, with the industrial revolution and with the publication of Adam Smith's um, Wealth of Nations, there was a, a wonderful moment in time when the intellectuals actually for a little while sided with free markets uh, and the genie got out of the bottle and the economy took off. And they've been trying to stuff that genie back in the bottle ever since, but, and they've been able to do it in some places, but in other places they haven't yet, yet been able to succeed. And as a result, you can see what's happened. It's absolutely astounding how much wealth has been increased. So capitalism really, we can think of as getting started, although it's been, We've had markets throughout. Human beings have been trading with each other since uh, we, we don't know. It probably throughout all time because we've always been traders. And that's one way to think of human beings is we, we're, we're makers and we're, we're creators and we are traders. And that's how human beings first began to make some progress, specialization of labor. But it really took off in the 1740s when Great Britain 
began to the industrial revolution, the factory system began to take root there. From there, it sort of migrated to the United States and then went on to continental Europe. For, for a while, the capitalism haters said that, well, it's just because they're exploiting everybody. It's, you know, they, they, they're, that's the only reason, the zero sum mentality. So they're just taking this from other people. It's very unjust. That began to be disproven strongly when we saw the Asian tigers in the 20th century. That, so the whole exploitation model began to, to be disproven when, when Singapore and Hong Kong and South Korea, Taiwan took off and began to reach Western civilizations um, uh, prosperity. And, and now it's continued to spread. So when the, when the Berlin Wall came tumbling down, it spread into um, Eastern Europe and those countries began to create wealth and they'd had their taste of socialism and communism and they knew that didn't work. And, uh, uh, and now it's spread increasingly into Latin America, but it's always on a continuum that we never, we never get um, perfect. For example, since China and, and uh, India, which have been socialistic countries, began to liberate their economies, we've seen literally hundreds of millions of people be lifted out of poverty. Does that mean they're capitalistic countries? Their degree of economic freedom is certainly less than it, it, it could be and less than it is in, in other countries in, the West, in countries in the West, but so much better than it was that with just some increase in economic freedom, poverty begins to decline. And if we just look at it and think about it, 200 years ago, 94% of everybody alive on the planet Earth, we go back to 1820, 94% lived on less than $2 a day. And that's adjusted for today's dollars. Um, now that's dropped down to under about 9%, under 10%. And if you go back 200 years ago, illiteracy rates were 88% of the world was illiterate. Now we're looking at that closer to 12%. The average lifespan back in 200 years ago was 30. And now across the planet, 72.6. And in Japan, it's over 80, which is the longest lived country in the world. So I like the economic freedom indexes. There, you know, Heritage Foundation does one, and so does the Fraser Institute. And these track the degree of economic freedom. And it's quite fascinating because the United States, which we think of as is very economically free, and for most of our history we have been, it fell as low as 18 just a few years ago. And now through in the last, in this new administration, or not so new anymore, the Trump administration has deregulated parts of the economy and it's cut corporate taxes in some ways. It's done other things that we may not think are, are very particularly good. But the United States is back down to number 12 in economic freedom. Most of our history would have been number one for, and that's how America became the rich country that it is today. It had economic freedom more than any other country. And it's not because Americans were like some kind of special, more intelligent uh, uh, culture. We just had economic freedom and we took advantage of it. And we built this amazing country that's become so affluent and has, has inspired the rest of the world. Although I think it's very interesting at number 12, of all the major English speaking countries in the world, we're now last in economic freedom. We see New Zealand is three, Australia is five, Ireland is six, the UK is seven, Canada is eight, and there's the United States at 12. So we're still pretty good at 12, but we could be a lot better. We could be even more prosperous than we are. Needless to say, the socialistic countries are the poorest countries in the world because socialism never has worked. So we see the, the bottom of the pack, it's Zimbabwe, the, the Republic of Congo, Cuba, Venezuela, and North Korea, least free and the most poor countries in the world. If we look at economic freedom on a per capita basis, the more economic freedom that you have, the higher the per capita income. So the, the countries that have the highest degree of economic freedom have a per capita income of 40,376, the least free, the most socialistic, is only $5,649 income per capita. If you look at who, if you're gonna be poor in this world, it's far better to be poor in a country that's economically free than a country that has little economic freedom. Because 
in the most free, the, the average, the poorest people make $10,660. That's their income earned. And the least free, it's only about 10% of that at uh, $1,345. I want to do, I want to talk a little bit about the Nordic countries because they're held out as, hey, socialism can work because it's being proved in the Nordic countries. Actually, what the Nordic countries are proving is that capitalism works because on, in terms of economic freedom, remember I said the United States ranked number 12. Well, Iceland is number 11, Denmark's 14, Sweden, which is held up as the, as the great example, is 19 in economic freedom, Finland's 20, Norway's 26. These are all extremely economically free countries. And I'm gonna focus in on Sweden, particularly. So first of all, Sweden became quite wealthy in the first part of the 20th century, when they, when they were very capitalistic and followed very strong free market policies. In the 1960s, which most people think of Sweden, they think they're still stuck in the 1960s. Sweden switched over to a more socialistic country for a while and economic freedom declined, their tax rates went sky high and their economic prosperity began to lessen. They became less and less economically free and they became gradually poorer and poorer. But they woke up. Since 1993, Sweden has reduced their public spending from to only 49% of their GDP from 67%. Now 49% is still very high. It's higher than the United States, but it's a lot lower than 67%. Most importantly, dropped their corporate tax rate to only 22%. They have a 0% inheritance tax. So there's no inheritance taxes in Sweden. And they offer educational vouchers to all children to be able to pick. So they have universal school choice in Sweden. This hardly sounds like a, a, a socialistic uh, dream come true. And when I'm talking to my socialistic friends, I generally ask them, so you favor a corporate tax of 22%? That's what Sweden does. Is that what you're in favor of? Do you favor no inheritance taxes? Sweden doesn't have them. And do you favor universal school choice? Because Sweden has those things. So Sweden is hardly this socialistic model that people want to hold up to. What they have is a stronger social welfare component to their, to their country. They're more, um, they're less ethnically diverse. They're, 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 they're more economically connected. It's a smaller country. Uh, there's more solidarity, higher degrees of trust. Uh, so social welfare spending is more accepted in Sweden and uh, in Nordic countries in general, but that's due to historical ethnicity and tribal affiliations that are more difficult in countries that are more ethnically and socially diverse as the United States is. Let's talk about poverty, for example. I already talked about how extreme poverty has fallen so very rapidly in the last 200 years. And you have to understand that's never happened before. This is unprecedented in human history. And that is due to economic freedom. That is due to capitalism. I want to talk a little bit about inequality of income because, um, that's, the, that's how capitalism is frequently attacked by the critics. Well, it creates money, but it, they, they have a zero sum game. So somebody's getting rich, so somebody else is getting poor. That's not true. That's not what capitalism does. It's a rising tide, it lifts all boats. And if we look at income distribution over longer periods of time in the history of our republic, you will see that in the last 200 years, the top 20% have basically gotten the same share of US income 200 years ago, 100 years ago, as they get today. The middle income, 40%, get about the same amount of the, of the income that they were getting 100 years ago and 200 years ago. Same with the bottom 40%. There hasn't been much change in the overall distribution of income in the history of our country. More importantly, is an incredibly important chart which um, the American Enterprise um, Institute comes up with out with an updates each year where they show share of US house, households by total money. And what people like to do that criticize inequality in America, they like to cherry pick their data. And one of the ways they cherry pick it is they talk about the, the well spread between the very, very richest people and the very poorest people. The very richest people might be a 10th of 1%. It's Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and yeah, those guys are extremely wealthy. But a better way to think about it 
is if we look at the high income group and the middle income group and the low income group, adjusting for inflation, the low income group, the group that makes less than $35,000 a year, in the last 50 years, that's declined from 37.2% of the households to 29.5%. So they've lessened. There's fewer poorer households in America than there used to be. Now we hear a lot about hollowing out of the middle class. And I suppose technically that's true because if you look at the, at the household incomes of people that made between $35,000 and $100,000 in 2017 dollars, that's declined from 53.8% of the population to only 41.3%. That's a pretty significant drop, right? That's a 30% drop. Oh my God, the, the middle class is being hollowed out. This is, this is a terrible thing. But is it really? Because where are they going? If you look at the income for families and households that make more than $100,000 a year, that was only 9% of the population in 1967. And it's 29%, 29.2% in 2017. So it's, it's gone up 350%. So it's a rising tide. Capitalism is not the zero sum game where a few people are getting rich and everybody else is getting poor. In fact, the poor are getting richer the people in the middle income areas are getting richer and we're getting more and more people that are in the high income brackets. It's a rising tide, it's lifting all the boats. Those are what the data shows. Inequality is um, more of a myth that is perpetuated by people that hate, that hate wealth and hate successful people and hate the prosperity that capitalism creates. So wealth isn't really the problem. What's the problem and inequality is not the problem. The real problem is poverty. Is it more important to have less inequality in wealth or is it more important to have less poverty? And to me, the answer is clear. We want to have less poverty. Wealth doesn't cause poverty. Poverty is the natural condition of human beings. Poverty is the default condition of the, of the human race. That's the way we found ourselves before capitalism came along. Everybody was poor. 94% of the people lived in less than $2 a day. That's the natural state of humanity, poor. Capitalism is creating wealth for billions of people. It's not a zero sum game where somebody gets rich and somebody else gets poor. Wealth does not come at somebody else's expense. That is a lie. That is a myth. It is the single biggest misunderstanding about capitalism, in my opinion. Instead, the problem is not that there's an unequal distribution of income. The problem is that there's an unequal distribution of economic freedom. Because the places that have greater economic freedom create greater prosperity. The places that don't have it create more poverty. So what we need to do is spread more economic freedom and more capitalism around the world. Jane Jacobs said it very well. To seek the causes of poverty, in this way is to enter an intellectual dead end because poverty has no causes. Only prosperity has causes. And let's talk about the opposite extreme. When people that criticize capitalism fundamentally don't have a better alternative. They, they can refer to the Swedish country, uh, the, the Nordic countries, but those are capitalistic countries. In the last hundred years, there have been 42 countries that have done, have gone socialistic, 42. And every country that has had socialism without exception has failed economically. There's never been an exception to this. Every time a new one comes out, the intellectuals talk about how great the USR is going to be, USSR was going to be. They talk about how great China is going to be, how great Cuba is going to be, how great Venezuela is going to be. And guess what? Every one of them fails. And so I, I've debated socialists and I always put this challenge out there. Name one socialistic country that's ever created prosperity in the world. You've got 42 to draw on. And the answer is zero. It doesn't work and it never will work. That's the truth. And let's look what else has happened with socialism. Well, because socialism is not based on voluntary exchange for mutual benefit as capitalism is, it's ultimately based on coercion Socialistic countries have murdered over 100 million of their own citizens in the past 100 years. 
It's consistently created poverty wherever it's become the governing philosophy, no exceptions. Venezuela, North Korea, Cuba, China, Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, they all created massive poverty. Because it's based on government coercion instead of freedom, individual freedoms and rights are in, inevitably suppressed. They always talk about creating more liberty and more freedom for people, and they always do the exact opposite. It's just a bait and switch. We're gonna give you more freedom, and they never do. They take freedom away. By definition, they restrict economic freedom. And when you begin to restrict economic freedom, all other freedoms begin to be restricted too. The real world history of socialism and history of coercion, murder, poverty, and no real scientific achievements to speak of. So the death toll in collectivism, 129.6 billion, I mean, million people in the last 70 years. The USSR killed 61.9 million of its citizens. The Chinese communists got over 35 million and the Nazis killed over 20.9 million. Yes, the Nazis. The Nazis were socialist. It stands for the national socialistic. <laughs> That's what Nazism means. I, I, I find it always interesting people wanna, they wanna talk about capitalism as Nazism or fascism. No, fascism and socialism, I mean fascism and Nazism are socialism. They were socialistic governments. That's what they adhered to. That's what they aspired to. So. There's not this left and right divide. The real divide is between economic freedom and the lack of economic freedom, between capitalism and socialism. And fascism and Nazism are just variants of socialism, just another form that was defeated primarily by the free West and the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, but because the intellectuals loved communism and socialism, they want the big lie that was told was that Germany and Italy were not socialistic, but they were, they were, and that's in the name. That's why we hear Nazis rather than national socialists. All of the Nobel Prize winners that we've achieved in the last 100 plus years, they've all come from places that have high economic freedom. The United States has 368 Nobel Prize winners. The UK has 132. Germany 107, France 62, Sweden 30, Switzerland 26, Japan 26, and Canada 23. Socialism does not create economic achievements. It doesn't win Nobel Prizes. Capitalism is ethically superior to socialism. One of the things they want to argue is yes, capitalism may create prosperity, but it's fundamentally evil. It's based on selfishness and greed and exploiting other people. No, that is a lie. Capitalism is based on the principle of voluntary exchange. No one has to trade with a business. No customer has to go shop some, nobody has to shop at Whole Foods Market. They don't like it and most, many people, most people don't like it, they go shop somewhere else. If nobody has to go work for a company, you have many competitive alternatives in the marketplace. People quit Whole Foods, for example, every single day. Every single day, we have people quitting our company and getting jobs that pay them better or have superior working conditions to what they were getting in Whole Foods. Um, nobody has to trade, no suppliers have to trade with the business. When Whole Foods was public company, nobody had to invest in the company. It's all based on voluntary exchange for mutual gain. Socialism, on the other hand, is fundamentally based on governmental coercion. It coerces people, it forces people to do things. And what does that mean? Ultimately, it's coercion with guns. You get arrested, thrown in jail, somebody comes with guns if you don't comply. Because capitalism is based on voluntary exchange, that creates mutual gains, mutual prosperity, and socialism believes in the myth of the zero-sum game. Somebody gaining, somebody else is losing. That is a lie. That is a fundamental lie that's told about capitalism. Capitalism forces, has competition, and that competition forces business to innovate, to get better, to provide better service, better products. That competition, if you don't get better, you eventually go out of business. Socialism doesn't allow competition. Socialism thinks it all should be monopolized by the state. The government should control everything. And when that happens, you have no incentives to get better. And that's the fundamental reason why socialism stagnates and doesn't work. There's no incentive for improvement. We all know this. 
whenever we deal with government agencies from uh, getting the new driver's license to social security, we wait in line, there's apathy, nobody cares about us, there's nobody, because what can you do? What's your alternative? When we're dealing with the government, you basically have to take what's given to you. It's why our schools aren't very good and they're government controlled. As healthcare is more regulated, healthcare gets worse and worse and worse. Um, that's socialism. It doesn't allow that competition to exist. Capitalism is ultimately based on individual freedom and self-responsibility. You're responsible for your own life. You're, you have freedom and you have to make choices about it. Socialism is based on forcing your individual freedom to be submitted to the control of governmental bureaucrats. That's a simple reality. We all, we all experience it when we deal with the government. And I want to say that this is also an argument ethically between the makers and the takers. As Margaret Thatcher famously said, the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. When socialism comes in, it takes away people's money and redistributes it. Not, this looks great. Look how well we're doing. But eventually, there's no more money to distribute. You can take away all Jeff Bezos' money and Bill Gates' money and Warren Buffett's and Elon Musk. How long does it last? It doesn't last that long. And then what have you got? You've, you're broke. There's nobody else's money to, to, to steal. And so the economy begins to, to go into the ground. Socialism is fundamentally based on an appeal to envy, envying other people's success, envying other people's wealth, and trying to say that they don't deserve it. They stole it from people and we're gonna take it back. It's fundamentally a rationalization for legalized theft from the most successful and wealthiest people. Capitalism, on the other hand, it rewards those who are creative, honest, hardworking, prudent, responsible and frugal who save and invest their money. Socialism, on the other hand, rewards those who are lazy, imprudent, wasteful, negligent, and extravagant. Socialism argues that there's this class warfare between the 1% and the 99%, when in reality, there are two major classes. There are those who create value for other people, they're the makers, and those who want to control, regulate, tax, and through coercion, the power of the gun, take the wealth that others create, and those are the takers. Winston Churchill famously said, socialism is the philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. Its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. That completes my presentation. That is one rousing presentation. Thank you. Thank it's you. actually inconceivable a reasonable person would come out in defense of socialism. So it's safe to say that case is made, but seemingly reasonable people come to the defense of interventionism left, right, and center all over. So Walter, it'll be very interesting to hear not just your defense of capitalism, but your defense of capitalism against perhaps more insidious and less alarming forms of intervention. Those ever so slight forms where the camel's nose is getting under the tent and before you know it, you've got a, a largely state-run society. Why should we come out swinging for capitalism, Walter? Well, thanks Josh for inviting me and thanks John for being my partner in this uh, endeavor. Uh, when Josh invited me, uh, he said, you know, speak for 15 or 20 minutes. And I took a few notes and I was going to babble on about uh, free enterprise, but um, I'm not going to do that. Or at least I'm not going to start away because I'm not going to let John get away with this. This is one of the most um, eloquent, uh, informational and inspiring speeches I've ever heard. Um, and I'm going to uh, take the role, at least initially, as a commentator on what he said, because I think what he said is just magnificent and needs to be expanded upon. So I'll, I'll sort of be a commentator. And I would say that I see him sort of as a, a Ronald Reagan. Uh, what, what John and Ronald Reagan had in common is they both spent most of their adult career in other fields other than promoting liberty. Ronald Reagan was an actor. John uh, was a grocer, if I could call him that, uh, oh, wow. without, without insulting him. Uh, he started and, as a busboy. 
ah, bus boy. Well, but he he wasn't his uh, Ronald Reagan and John Mackey's careers initially was not to promote liberty. It was uh, in very different areas, and and uh, I I I've never really heard a much better speech than that. And I'm really inspired. I'm ready to go out and and you know promote capitalism as if I wasn't doing that uh, anyway. I think this is really magnificent. So I'd like to comment a little bit on what he said, uh, expand, elaborate. Uh, I really have no criticisms. Uh, a commentator is supposed to have criticisms, but I don't really have any. It's just more of an expansion. Uh, John mentions it's not a zero-sum game. Well, what's a zero-sum game? A zero-sum game is poker. The winnings of the winners eat the losings of the losers. But capitalism is not like that at all. Capitalism is necessarily uh, improved. Um, welfare improving. For example, I bought this yellow shirt. How much did I pay for the yellow shirt? I paid 10 bucks for it. Well, how much did I value that yellow shirt at the time that I bought it at? Well, more than 10 bucks, otherwise I wouldn't have bought it. Uh, the thing about this shirt, now maybe it's because I, I thought to pay for the yellow shirt seller, but, but there was something about that yellow shirt that I valued it more than $10. So I gained a profit, hate to use dirty words, but I'm gonna use a dirty word profit. I gained a profit. Uh, how about the guy who sold me the shirt? He must have valued that yellow shirt at less than $10, otherwise he wouldn't have sold me. He probably had 10,000 of them and he valued it at a penny or negative. He's glad to get rid of it. So he made a profit. So the way the Marxists would say it is we each exploited the other, which is, you know, nonsense on a stick. We each aimed for each other. It was not a zero-sum game. Uh, John is quite right. The Nazis are national socialists. The commies are international socialists. Well, what's the big difference? Who cares whether it's national or international? It's socialism, and you know, uh, uh, it, it's a problem. Now, John did mention incentives. Why? Why the? Why is it that no socialist country ever <laughs> improved wealth? Um, and he mentions incentives. I would just add Hayek and Mises. Hayek mentioned. Um, informational flows. Uh, even if we had super duper computers and, and everybody knew everything, how could the central, uh, how could the central authorities know uh, what Hayek calls the specific knowledge of time and place? For example, uh, I know that Joe is a better worker than Charlie on this and Charlie is a better worker than Joe on that. How the hell is the central planning bureau ever going to find out that sort of a thing? And that's what Hayek mentioned. And um, Mises mentions um, chaos, economic chaos. Unless we have prices that reflect scarcity and desire, we don't know whether to make railroad ties out of iron or platinum. Look, platinum is better. Maybe we should make all uh, railroad ties, uh, uh, rails out of platinum. Well, no, because platinum has a higher price, which indicates that it's got more important uses that we can't waste platinum on, on railroad ties. So Mises is making points like that. Uh, the last point I want to do as my commentator, before I get into some points of my own, is this hollowing out of the middle class. Well, first of all, it's hollowed out under a mixed economy. So we don't know if it's hollowed out because of, uh, of capitalism or in spite of capitalism. That, that's a, a, an unknown issue. I, uh, by the way, this shirt is a, a shirt based on, uh, I do 5Ks and half marathons and stuff like that. And I tell you, in a half marathon, the whole thing gets hollowed out. <laughs> There are people that, you know, are running a half marathon in about an hour, and my time is about three and a half hours. I'm a race walker. I don't run. I've had too many surgeries to run anymore. By the way, I was on the track team with Bernie Sanders, and he and I had roughly the same views, and I've changed a little. He hasn't. Uh, the point is, there's nothing wrong with hollowing out, even if it occurred under pure laissez-faire capitalism, which, as John says correctly, we never had. But even if it did, what's wrong with hollowing out? We have hollowing out in races. We have hollowing out in uh, chess, uh, uh, whatever, uh, uh, chess rankings. You know, maybe there are very few people between 1700 and 1900. A lot of people are grandmasters and a lot of people are wood pushers. There's nothing wrong with hollowing out. Uh, per se. It just means that some people are very, very productive and other people are not that very productive and there are very few people in the middle. So what? Uh, I don't see that as a problem. Okay, that ends uh, my uh, commentating on uh, John's um, beautiful, beautiful talk. I want to just mention a few uh, other points. One point is, how do you become a, an employer? How do you become a firm? John mentions that at one time, prehistory, uh, you know, we had trade, but everyone was working for himself. There was a time before there were companies. 
How did a company arise? And the reason I mention this is our friends on the left, they're always saying, well, companies are exploiting workers, and I want to get into that. Well, okay, let's say the three of us here, and Cheyenne is the fourth here, we're each independent workers. And um, John, I'm going to make him the employer. How does he become an employer? We're each working, we're sort of hand to mouth and, and, you know, we're above subsistence level a little bit, but we're not very rich. And what John does, what he necessarily does is he saves and the, and the three of us don't save anything. And now John saves a little bit and he comes to um, Josh and he says, hey, Josh, come work for me. I will pay you more than you're making on your own. And how can John afford to pay Josh more than Josh is making on his own? Because specialization and division of labor. If John and Josh work together, they can produce more than twice as much that, that either of them separately. That's how a firm starts. There's nothing wrong with a firm. There's nothing wrong with a business firm. There's nothing wrong with, uh, uh, with a company. It just starts because some worker hired another worker on a voluntary basis and was able to pay him more in salary than he was making on his own. How do we get a corporation? Well, a corporation is just a, uh, a legitimate contract where um, uh, people say, look, uh, if you want to sue us, you can only sue us for uh, uh, the amount that we put into the corporation. Not if we, you know, violate rights or something, then we're responsible. But if, if you have a problem, you know, like uh, you, you sold us a shirt and the shirt didn't work, we're only liable for the amount we put into the firm. Don't like it, don't, don't, uh, don't buy from a, from a corporation. There's nothing wrong with the corporate form. Okay, uh, the second point that I have in my notes, now I'm giving my own speech apart from what John said, voting with the feet. Voting with the feet is very important. Now you think voting with the feet is you, you take your foot up here, by the way, I don't have shoes on, you can see, and, and you go into a, um, a ballot box and you sort of press the thing instead of with your finger, you press it with your feet. No, 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 that's not what voting with the feet means. What voting with the feet means is looking at um, migration and immigration patterns. You know, they say that the US is a racist place. Well, are blacks leaving? No. Blacks aren't leaving the U.S. Blacks are trying to come into the U.S. From which we uh, uh, deduce that uh, there's something about the U.S. that's better for blacks than where, wherever it is that they're coming from. Were the Jews trying to get into Nazi Germany or out of Nazi Germany? Well, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, <laughs> an easy one. They were trying to get out, from which we deduce that uh, for some reason it wasn't so good. Black people in the 1930s were trying to get out of the South and into Detroit and Philadelphia and other places like that, from which we deduce that things were better for them there. Well, where are the migration patterns? From socialism to capitalism or from capital to socialist place? Anyone trying to get into Venezuela? Anyone trying to get into Cuba? No. I mean, if you're in Cuba, you're trying to get out. You're trying to go to Florida. You're in Venezuela. You're trying to get out of there which is a very eloquent way of uh, seeing what's going on because, you know, government statistics can be, um, I mean, Venezuela statistics for all I know can go up and then the Cubans are always bragging about, uh, you know, under Fidel that they have better education or this or that or medicine. They're trying to get out, which indicates to me in a very big way what's going on there. Uh, John mentioned um, Jane Jacobs. I want to mention Peter Bauer. Um, Peter Bauer is, a f I'm a fan of his, as is uh, John of um, uh, Jane Jacobs. Uh, Peter Bauer has done more, um, made more of a major contribution to uh, African poverty and, and why it is that certain African countries are doing well and other African countries aren't doing well. So I thought I'd mention him. And guess what Peter Bauer found? Yes, the free enterprise plays a very significant role. Uh, I want to um, also talk about um, black poverty. Why is it that black people are so poor? Well, one reason is that their families are um, not forming. Uh, uh, not that they're breaking up, they're not forming in the first place. And uh, uh, what is it, something like 75% of black kids are brought up in families without uh, a father present, with a, a non-intact family. Now, th th it's, uh, I'm not being a racist here. I'm not saying that there's something intrinsic in black people that uh, they can't form families. The very opposite is the truth. Uh, let me give you an analogy. If you put a frog into uh, cold water and you heat it up, the frog's metabolism is such that it stay in there and get boiled a lot. On the other hand, if you put a frog in boiling water, it just jumps out. 
Well, slavery was boiling water for the black family. Yes, slavery broke up the black family during slavery. You know, this person was sold here, that person was sold there. But in the aftermath of slavery, uh, people, black people were getting together. There were ads in the, in the papers in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Joe, uh, this is Mary. Um, Let's get back together. We're a family. My research in the 1900 and 1910 census showed that the black and the white family were roughly as intact uh, as the white family. It was a difference by a percentage or two, but the black family is very intact. Then what happened was LBJ, with his great society, boosted up welfare uh, very, very much and uh, made an offer to a, um, a, a poor uh, a girl who was pregnant, uh, a much better offer than the uh, amount of money that um, uh, could, w could be forthcoming from the father of her child. Why uh, did this affect black people? Because they were more vulnerable because they were, and if you uh, a certain amount of money to rich people and a certain amount of money to poor people, people will take it uh, to a greater degree. What is the rate of, of poverty of intact black families? It's in the single digits. There is virtually no poverty among black people where there's an intact family. So the analysis that I'm putting forth, and here I'm, I'm uh, basing my uh, analysis on Charles um, uh, Murray and his book, Losing Ground, uh, that's why we have that problem. It's not because of capitalism and not because of exploitation or anything like that. I wanted to um, talk about this guy, uh, Applebaum, who wrote a, a piece attacking Milton Friedman. He, he says that, um, first of all, he calls Milton Friedman a, a free market ideologue. Well, Milton Friedman was not a total free market ideologue. Milton Friedman uh, favored antitrust and negative income tax. He was a road socialist. He opposed the privatizing all highways. He favored the Fed. He opposed the gold standard. He had neighborhood effects. He even said, we're all Keynesians now. Uh, well, you know, no free market ideologue can ever say we're all Keynesians now. Uh, so I, I think Applebaum misconstrues Milton Friedman's uh, viewpoints. Uh, also, um, Milton Friedman had the, the, uh, a movement toward egalitarianism. He favored um, uh, uh, government support of education on, on neighborhood uh, grounds effects, on the idea that uh, if we only have uh, privatized education, uh, people will only have so much education based on whether it helps them or not. But there are spillover effects. There are external economies or um, uh, economic uh, externalities. Uh, that benefit other people. So he said that the free market would misallocate resources into not enough education and into too much pollution. And Alan um, uh, appreciate uh, this uh, aspect of what Milton Friedman uh, was saying. Last point, uh, and, and then I'll stop. Um, uh, Applebaum says that people make profits at the expense of society. No, 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 they don't make profits at the expense of society. Uh, the way John Mackey made profits in, in Whole Foods was by providing people with a, uh, a different grocery experience than that was available elsewhere. Uh, he didn't make profits at the expense of society. He made profits by supporting society, by supporting all the customers and, and workers and, and other people that have anything to do with Whole Foods. So I will end now. I, I was uh, honored uh, to be able to be a commentator on John's excellent presentation, and I hope I added a few more points of my own. Thank you, Walter. Thanks, Walter. John, any questions, comments, reactions to what Walter shares before we launch into some questions from me? I made some notes. Um, one thing he left out when he was talking about uh, people trying to get out of Cuba and get into Florida and uh, the best ex historical example is the Berlin Wall. That was not built by the West Germans to keep the West German citizens from flowing over to the communist socialistic utopia of their neighbors. It was because they built it because so many Eastern Germans were getting the heck out of their part of Berlin so they, they could create better lives for themselves and their families. And I think Walter's um, insight there needs to be underscored People vote with their feet, and uh, I know Whole Foods, we employ literally thousands of immigrants that have come over to the United States. And the United States, gosh, we have more immigrants in our country that weren't born here than, I don't know, the next three largest countries combined in terms of immigration. People have come over here of all ethnicities, all races, all countries, and um, 
you know, I'll just tell you a story that kind of sums it all up for me. Okay. So a few years ago, I was, um, I was doing a speech somewhere in Chicago and I, and I was a paid speech. So I got, I got picked up. A driver met me at the baggage claim and he had an accent and I couldn't quite place the accent. So I said, so where are you from originally? He said, I'm from Bhutan. And it was like, Bhutan, what do I know about Bhutan? I've never been there. Oh yeah, Bhutan. That's the happiest place in the world. That's how it's portrayed as the happiest place in the world. So I asked him, I said, Bhutan, you, you guys are supposed to be the happiest place in the world. Is, is that true? And he said, yes, we are very happy in Bhutan. And so then I said, well, if you're so happy in Bhutan, how come you're here? And he says, happiness overrated. <laughs> no, my, my daughter, my daughter is in medical school. My doctor is going to be, my daughter is going to be a doctor. She could not be a doctor in Bhutan. Think about that. Think about what all that means, the implications of it. The coming over here for a better life for his, not just himself. He was, he was probably working two jobs to, 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 to pay for the medical school. And I'm sure she had some financial aid too, but what an accomplishment for his family. He was so proud of his daughter. Parents will sacrifice for their children and uproot themselves, go to a place where they don't speak the language, they don't know anybody, have any connections, to try to create a better life for their families. Guess where they migrate to? To capitalistic countries, always out of the socialistic countries. The reverse migration is practically nothing. Just actually a few socialistic ideologues who want to go over there. And, and uh, I just think that's very important. The walls are built to keep people in to their utopian socialistic countries and they want to get the heck out and i think that says it all kind of right there in a succinct uh story i'm gonna right steal story. i'm gonna steal this one this is magnificent happiness is overrated my god that, that is so that is well, beautiful well, <laughs> it was pretty funny i was shocked when he said that <laughs> hey you know something uh, something i'd like to talk about um because we talked a lot about how prosperous capitalism has made the world, it creates more economic freedom. So it raises a very interesting question is why do so many people dislike it? If it creates so much prosperity, if it creates better lives for people, why is it so disliked? I'm gonna ask that question. I have an opinion about that, but I'm gonna ask Walter what he thinks. I happen to have written an article on this. Uh, and um, what we said was it's socio-biological. So let me talk a little bit about sociobiology. And again, to repeat John's question, why if capitalism is such a great system or most it? So what's sociobiology? Sociobiology is the theory that says we are the way we are now uh, because we're hard to be the way we are now because uh, a million years ago, uh, there were uh, reasons to give more children into the next generation if you acted this way than acted that way. For example, most people are afraid of this. Nobody's afraid of a bathtub. Who's afraid of a bathtub? Uh, the whole thing is ridiculous. Nobody's afraid of a bathtub. And yet bathtubs kill more people than snakes now. So why are little kids afraid of, uh, of a snake and all of us are viscerally afraid of a snake and not of a bathtub? Because a million years ago, when we were in the caves or in the trees, uh, if you had a fear of bathtubs, it didn't help you at all to leave more children into the next generation, mainly leave your GDP, GDP, uh, your um, hardwiring to the next generation. Uh, whereas if you weren't afraid of snakes, you uh, had a problem. So that would be uh, uh, one example of that. Well, how much trade was there? How much trade was there when we we're in the trees or the caves? There was some, as, as John mentioned. And um, the second part of this long article, it's maybe a 90 page article, and I'll send it to you if you're interested in this as well, uh, was that um, my colleague, John Lavendis, uh, one of my co-authors said, well, you know, they discovered uh, in, in Italy or in France or Spain or somewhere the, a, whole, uh, a thousand pots. And, and, and the tribe was only 50 people, so why did they need a thousand pots? And over there, they discovered a thousand spears 10 miles away. And, and we uh, deduced from that that there was trade. So there was trade, but it wasn't um, deeply embedded in our hard wiring. 
Whereas um, benevolence was much more deeply embedded. Because if we were a small tribe of 30 or 50 people, and this week I'm sick, and you help me, and next week you're sick, and I help you, our tribe will survive. But if this week I'm sick and you don't help me, and uh, you're sick, I'm not help you, we fall. So benevolence is deeply, deeply embedded in us. Uh, uh, I mean, if, if, uh, you know, if, if somebody starts coughing, everyone rushes over to give them the Heimlich maneuver. Uh, you know, if, if we see somebody lying on the floor, our natural instinct is to help. So we are very benevolent, but we're not, but our instinct or our hard wiring toward free trade is, is only 10,000 years old. Whereas our uh, benevolence is, um, goes back to the mammals and maybe even back to the uh, alligators and, uh, who protect their eggs for a while. So this would be an explanation as to why we are, uh, why it's so tough. Why Paul gets 1% of the vote when if Ron Paul were president, you know, my favorite politician, um, uh, you know, we'd have much more of a free enterprise situation. So that's a rough explanation uh, uh, to John's question. I'm not sure we, we nailed it, but at least it's a... Uh, uh, Let's hear it. John, uh, did, did we nail it? And do you, do you have uh, another question? I've got, I've got my own perspective on it. So um, please share. I do share what Walter talked about, um, the, the envy factor. And I just go a little further than that. I think the class enemy, we know the socialists talk a lot about classes, you know, war with each other. If we use that metaphor, the class enemy of capitalism or the intellectuals, because they've always disdained commerce. I, I picked this up when I read uh, Deidre McCloskey's great trilogy of books, the bourgeoisie series. And, um, that wasn't new. They've always disdained commerce as something that common people did, tradesmen did. They, had a, they were superior to them because they were intellectuals and they didn't get their hands dirty. So they disdained that type of work. And it, but I also think what Walter said is true. Today, uh, the intellectuals go into, they go into the academy and that's why such a high percentage of the academy is democratic or Democrats and not Republicans and, and, uh, and why they disdain capitalism. It's a very high percentage do not like capitalism and favor socialism whenever I see the surveys. And it's natural because I think, I think that professor is making more than $45,000 because I think a lot of money is being funneled into the universities now. But they're not making as much money as that guy that went to the fraternity and got drunk every night, but made a lot of friends and went into business and ended up making a lot of money because in their minds, they're smarter than those people. It's an unjust society that doesn't reward the smartest people, but our society rewards people based on their value creation, not their IQ. <laughs> and, and by the way, business people are a heck of a lot smarter that, uh, than, um, the intellectuals think they are. There's lots of different ways to measure intelligence, but I can tell you the smartest people I've met, people like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, these guys are super smart, super smart. So that's the first one. But the, the second explanation I have will, will be something that Walter and I will, will, will talk about. If we don't get it done today, we'll talk about when we, when we have a, a debate or whatever down the road. And I'm increasingly convinced that the thing that's holding capitalism back more and more and more is that we have the wrong framework. Uh, we don't have the right narrative and we fall into the hands of our enemies because the primary narrative is a win-lose narrative. People see the framework people filter reality through is very binary, good versus evil, light versus darkness, um, greed versus altruism. Uh, we've got this real binary framework and prosperity for people. I just hear it again and again and again. They think some, they have got a zero sum. They've got a zero sum mentality. If somebody else is getting wealthy, somebody else is getting poor. So if you take, and that's what the, the whole stakeholder theory is being totally misunderstood because here's the reality of capitalism. It's not, a win-lose it's not a zero-sum game it is not a sporting event where somebody is a champion of the Super Bowl 
and everybody else loses. It's not that way. It's not a winner take all society. That is the wrong metaphor. What capitalism is done, but it's so alien to the way we think about reality. Capitalism has created a win, win, win game. All the people that are trading with the business voluntarily are winning or they wouldn't be trading. There's not this loser. Yes, even the competitors are improved because they're forced to innovate, imitate and get better. So it's not this win-lose game, but the intellectuals think about it that way. So they're always talking about if somebody's getting wealthier, then that's causing inequality. And it's, it's like everybody's thinking about it. Almost everybody thinks about it in terms of a win-lose framework. And to truly understand business, we have to shift the frame, to truly understand it and win the argument, we have to shift that framework to something people doesn't come natural to them. That actually capitalism is not about some winning and some losing. It's really about the whole society winning. It's a win-win-win game. You win, you trade with me and you win. I win because you trade with me. And guess what? The larger society is winning too. <laughs> And th that's why the social responsibility thing is misunderstood and misframed because people are thinking in terms of trade-offs and economists naturally think in terms of trade-offs. Well, if you're going to take money from the investors, then they're going to make less. And uh, if you give it to some charity, then there's going to be less money to go around. Or if you're paying more, then there's less to go around. The whole art of business leadership is to see that it's more of a system that, that these so-called stakeholders are interdependent. They're not, they're not against each other. They're not at war with each other. There's not one winning or losing. A, a, a good business leader has to create value for their customers or they're gonna fail. So they have to keep high quality and good prices and good service or, that's, or they're gonna fail. Um, you have to pay people well in order for them to want to continue to work for you. So, so you're under competition to get your pay up to the market or even better than the market so that you will have greater retention, less turnover rates. Same thing, so all of these things are done voluntarily and everybody's looking for their own best interests. But if you're, if you're like a business leader and you're trying to optimize the entire system because where maximizing profits is fundamentally misunderstood. And when Walter and I have this debate that we will be thinking about it a little bit differently. So I'm, I'm going to tip him off on what my argument's going to be in advance. Yes, of course, we're always trying to maximize profits. And the best way to maximize profits is to create value for customers, have great relationships with your employees who create the value, have favorable relationships with your suppliers who help give you the things that you're trading, and that leads to maximizing profits. It's not a zero sum game. It's a win, win, win. It, purpose and profits aren't opposites. They're partners, profits now, and purpose. I, I, I'm gonna hit the, the pause button for a moment. Don't, don't tip your hand too much. I'm not tipping my hand. I, don't I, know I'm, I know that I'm right. He can know it in advance. The point is capitalism is misunderstood because we tell the wrong narrative about it. And until we change that narrative, if we're just gonna argue that profit is good because maximizing profits is the only good, in, in, a, in a binary world, we're gonna be misunderstood and capitalism is gonna be hated and attacked. We are playing into the hands of our enemies. We have to explain it in terms of the greater wins all around. Everybody's winning, not just Jeff Bezos. Everybody's winning. That's the narrative. I suspect we are we are going to be in furious agreement, Walter, despite your inclination that there's a, a true debate. But before we dive into that, John, I want to challenge one thing you said, which is that it's not so intuitive for people to to latch on to this mutuality. It's it's more natural to think of a zero sum game. It's a harder concept for people to grasp. I think it is very intuitive. In this conversation, just as a microcosm, Walter was giddy at the exchange of information. He can't wait to latch onto your story and share that, right? And you ask him questions and you benefit. You share information and you both end up the better for it. If Walter, if John had some fruit and Walter had some fruit and John gave you an apple and Walter, you gave him an orange, you guys trade, you're both happier. It's very intuitive. It does seem, John, more to your point, your, your second point, that it really is a matter of controlling the narrative. 
because it's such a simple concept that there's mutual benefit from look interaction way, and trade. Look at the way business is explained, Josh. I agree. It's it's not hard to understand, but that's not the narrative that's used. That's not the metaphors that are used in business. The first metaphor series of metaphors are war metaphors. We're going to crush those guys. We're going to kill them. That's they're, they're, this is, and if it's not war metaphors, we go into the war room, we create a campaign, we, we get, let's go inspire the troops. We're using military metaphors, which is war. And in war, you're trying to destroy the other side or we're using Darwinian survival of the fittest metaphors. It's a jungle out there. It's kill or be killed. It only the paranoid survive. So we have, or they're sports metaphors. In sports metaphors, there is the one winner and everybody else is the loser. Nobody remembers second place. Um, and, and so these metaphors are how we think about business. We think it in these hyper competitive terms. And yes, competition is one element in business, but it's not the dominant. The dominant element in business is value creation for other people. It creates value for everyone who's trading with it. It's the most amazing system that's ever been created by humanity. And yet it's put in this narrow box of greed versus altruism or your nonprofit or your for-profit. It's put in this morality play and it's seen as darkness because, hey, Statistically, 90% of the murders that you see on movies and television are committed by businessmen. In reality, business people are far, kill less, far less than 1% of the murders. <laughs> but yet, that's how they're held up. They deliberately go dump everything into the, they dump their pollution in the streams, they exploit their workers, they are, they cheat their customers, they, they, they're terrible people. We always hear about the robber barons. They're, they're morally horrible. They, the whole working class was exploited. It's the whole immiseration thesis that Marx put out there. People still believe it. We don't tell the right narrative. I had a few comments I wanted to make, uh, adding on again to what John is saying. I, I would just say it's not just uh, businessmen, it's white uh, male businessmen who are straight because they're the only ones that it's safe to criticize because if you criticize blacks or women or gays or anyone you're evil but white uh, toxic males are you know a fair game um i i wanted to get back to uh, my theory um if if sociology is a partial correct analysis of why we have such difficulties how do you explain the three of us how do you explain milton friedman or uh, hayek or mises or rothbard uh, or ron paul we are mutants we're weirdos. We're, we're, we're different. Somehow, look, I started out like with Bernie Sanders. I had the views, but Ayn Rand, another mutant, uh, you know, converted me to free enterprise. So we're weirdos. Uh, another issue is, uh, John mentions the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is a positive sum game. Both of them gain. Those football players are all making, I don't know what the salary is. I screwed up the salary of, um, of um, poetry professors. Not 45, it's more like 90,000, but, but still it's way less than the guy who has a McDonald's franchise. Uh, the Super Bowl guys are making a million, five million, uh, even the loser. I mean, you know, right now we're having the NBA finals uh, between, uh, what is it, um, uh, LA and, um, and Miami. And, and Miami. Uh, they're all making five, 10, 15, 20, $30 million, even the losers, you know, what they're doing is putting on a, a play, if I could uh, use that analogy, and, and they're all gaining. Uh, and, and they're selling uh, tickets, well, not now because of the uh, COVID, but uh, they're selling advertising. So they're all gaining. The game monopoly, remember the game monopoly? Now that's an example of a zero sum game. And yet a lot of people think that the real world is like monopoly. Look, when I land on boardwalk with a, a hotel on and I pay 2000, I lose, right? Whereas if I go to a hotel now, uh, you know, let's say I'm going to another city and I stay in a motel or a hotel, I gain. Yes, I pay 150 and 300 a night or whatever I pay. The only reason I pay it is because I value uh, the uh, comfort of the place more than the money. And because they value the fact that I'll dirty up their place and I'll have to clean it up after me or uh, uh, less th than the money they get from me. Monopoly is a very bad game in, in a sense. And a lot of people think that the market is like Monopoly, but the market is not like Monopoly. Even in chess, there's a winner and a loser. But when the grandmaster chess players uh, uh, play, again, it's like a play. 
and, and they're both gaining from the game. Now, another question is, why is it that the universities are so leftish? Why is it that uh, the sociology department, there'll be 30 members of the department, and there'll be 29 Democrats and one independent and, and no Republican? <laughs> And, and the sociology department and the feminist studies department and the black studies and the queer studies and, and all these other department history, very, very bad. Economics a little bit better. Economics is probably the best uh, in terms of a more uh, equal um, uh, ideological representation. But uh, still, I think the Democrats outweigh, well, it, it's close. But why is it? And Milton Friedman has an interesting theory. He said it's the Vietnam War. During the Vietnam War, the people who were on the left didn't want to go fight. They were against the war. And uh, the only way to stay out of the war and, and not be put in jail is to stay in school. So they stayed in school and they all got PhDs that they wouldn't have otherwise got but for the uh, Vietnam War. And uh, the people on the right uh, had no such uh, opposition to the Vietnam War. So they went and fought and they didn't go to graduate school. Well, then uh, they, they uh, had a disproportionate number of PhDs, assistant professors, associate professors, professors, deans, provosts, college presidents. That's why uh, the university is uh, biased toward the left in a way that it was before the Vietnam War. Now, I don't know that that's a full explanation, but I think it's um, part of the truth. So, so we're, we're coming up to the buzzer here. And before we fully wind down, just one more question I want to put to you, and this is really around our audience. Why should leaders, whether they're CEOs, founders, business owners, presidents, or others, why should they be paying attention to this conversation now? What makes this important to the CEO or the leader who has 200 emails they haven't read? And John, you've been in the trenches. You've been through this. When there are so many fires they're fighting, what makes this conversation germane and so relevant to them? Because if we don't fight for our economic freedom, the enemies of capitalism are gonna take it away. And, and if business people will not defend the system that, uh, it, it kind of reminds me of, um, well, I won't go there, but, uh, I was going to say it reminds me of something in Atlas Shrugged, but I think I'll, I won't use that reference in this conversation. But if business people will not defend the system that enables them to freely trade with each other, then they won't be able to keep it. I mean, we're, the, the business people should be the defenders of capitalism. And I think it, Milton Friedman pointed out they frequently do not defend it. Um, and it's right now, People so much, I think a lot of times it's just like business people are not intellectuals. They more or less just want to be left, let me do my business. And so it's like, you, what do you want me to say? I'll say that, but just leave me alone now so I can get back to doing the business. I want to make trades. And uh, they're not, they're not um, they don't defend the system because they don't necessarily understand it either. It hasn't been explained to them. It's not, the capitalism system is not celebrated it is not, you go through, you can go through college and never only hear about bad things about capitalism. And so it's, it's so part of it's to the educational system that the, the, the haters of capitalism have control of it. So business people aren't even getting taught the goodness of the capitalistic system. Um, but then again, I think also there's this, um, and they don't want to be canceled. They, they, they just keep their head down. And I think uh, it takes courage to go and defend capitalism. I know because I do defend it and I am continually attacked. I pay a price for it. They, and by the way, they attack my company and that's how they try to get back at me. So uh, I think that's why. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Walter, uh, what say you? The solution for that and the is they're selling the rope that will be used to hang them. Look at the business round table uh, and BLM. Now look, obviously black lives, all lives, blacks are a part of the human race, so they matter also, but not only black lives matter, blue lives matter, white lives matter, all lives matter. And, but the BLM is a Marxist organization. Uh, they have Marxism. 
the business roundtable and, and vast numbers of business people are um, uh, supporting Black Lives Matter. Uh, so now I'm attacking your colleagues, John, and I attack, uh, and we both attack my colleagues, namely the intellectuals. So we are outliers, both in the business field for you and in the academic field for me. We're in a very, very distinct minority. And 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 uh, to answer Josh's question, why is this uh, conversation important to be spread out, not only among business leaders but students, among everyone? I have grandchildren. They're five-year-old twins. I have a son and a daughter. I want them to have a better life. And they'll have a better life if we go more toward uh, Switzerland, Hong Kong, or, well, not Hong Kong, but uh, uh, toward more economic freedom than if we go toward Venezuela. So I, I think that that's a, a very important reason why people should listen to this uh, conversation. Uh, and and uh, I thank you, John, for uh, creating it. Well, uh, one closing point here, John, I know decentralization is one of the values you spoke about in your, your book. And to the extent you can enroll people in a company in decentralization and share the implications of that, it seems like you really could gain traction in promoting free trade. Um, though I think there were some more, more mundane applications to decentralization, John, that you shared. But it, it seems like it really is a system people need to get on board with fighting for if we, we want to be able to preserve the, the, the system that enables our prosperity. This was a, an enlightening conversation, to put it lightly. I'm going to distill some notes so people can have a, a quick fact sheet with some of the key points that, that you both shared. Uh, before we close it up, last words. How about, uh, Walter, you first? Well, I just want to thank uh, uh, Josh for putting this together and John for um, uh, inspiring me even the more, although I, I admit I was inspired to promote capitalism before, but still uh, I, I'm more invigorated now than before. And I, I thank John uh, for his contribution. Hey, Josh, again, thank you for putting it together. Uh, Walter's great to sort of virtually meet you because I've been uh, an admirer of yours and you you, I've read your Defending the Undefendable, part one, part two. I, you're, you're a provocateur and you like to shake things up and I like provocateurs because uh, I'm kind of one myself and uh, I've just had to keep my head down a little bit more running a big corporation so that, you know, like you want to protect your children and generally my children are what they try to attack. <laughs> so um, I'm very concerned about where the United States is right now. And I'm very, very concerned. We're, it, we're, at a, we're, we're getting near a crisis point. This election cycle is gonna be very interesting. This, this stupid virus has, uh, has been a wedge that, that the people that wanna take our country over and control it are using it and Americans are, are scared. And uh, uh, it's, it's, we're, we're maximum vulnerability right now. And so we gotta get through this virus and we got to get uh, we got to get past this election cycle, and uh, we just got to maintain freedom. We got to maintain freedom in America. It's what's made America what it is. Take away our economic freedom, and we will become one of those crummy failed states. We'll take a while. We're pretty rich, but it won't take more than a couple generations before we are <laughs> before we're broke, if if less, because they the way they want to spend money. So I'm very concerned, and uh, that's one of the reasons I'm speaking up here today. So I think some, some famous person once said that we're only one generation from losing our freedom. And I, I wanted to mention the fact that, uh, thanks to Josh, John and I are now co-authors of, of an op-ed piece, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll get it published soon. <laughs> we're so, having trouble getting that marketed, though. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, this is certainly not the end of the discussion, my friends. Just the beginning of a series. We'll see you two again at some point in the not-too-distant future. John, tremendous thanks. Walter, tremendous thanks to you a provocative conversation.